Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Doorways to the Space Economy. My name is Perry Lamb, and I'll be a moderator today, along with a panel of esteemed thought leaders. To begin, I'd like to thank Cyberport for being our venue sponsors. To set the context for this webinar today, I was speaking with a good friend of mine, James, last week, and he said, Perry, what's all this about the space economy? In Hong Kong, we don't even have rockets or satellites. And I said, James, it's all about the space or satellite technology and our dependence upon it. For example, traffic management at the Hong Kong International Airport we actually have autonomous vehicles, vehicles that drive themselves. And this is made possible through GPS as well as Baidu, also the enablement of 5G today and in the future 6G. So what does this all mean? For example, in terms of climate change, there's potential of ocean pollutions that could cause catastrophic landslides and flash floods. But we're able to monitor the states of these utilizing the space technology. Last week, we just emerged from analog and now digital. In fact, in Hong Kong, we have a very sophisticated technology law, which is a big advantage to us. In terms of the telecommunication law, it's quite significant. The challenge though, is that with sensing as well as with our space law itself, we need to catch up. Hong Kong being one of the key international market places, people may not recognize the fact that each transaction requires a timestamp. Without the, the results could be arbitrage. A few milliseconds can make this difference between significant gains versus significant losses. Also, triangulation in which we can locate things on the ground utilizing our space technology. Now, last week in Europe, there was the Space Week we're able to focus on two key things, COVID-19 as well as 5G, and those aren't going away. The reality is that many governments in Europe had made significant investments in terms of the digital infrastructure. Without that, it'd be the digital divide. What's happened today, children, we're not able to attend classes because of COVID-19 can still continue their education via computers at home. The same thing, doctors who are separated by patients because of the COVID-19 as well, can still provide the critical medical attention that the patients need. And this is also true in the areas of the biotechnology. So with that, the digital infrastructure plays a key role. Let's look at smart buildings. Potential water leaks can cause significant damages in buildings. And yet they are monitored through our space technology same thing with industrial buildings. A new source for clean food are monitored 
in terms of the health of the actual food sources which are being grown. Today, our elderly, because of COVID-19, distance away because of safety. And yet we're still able to monitor them remotely, as well as in the case of elderly, if they should fall, they could get quite significant injury. Fortunately, we have IoT, Internet of Things technology, to be able to monitor that. And lastly, in the case of COVID-19, the various max vaccines that are coming and made available worldwide, we're able to monitor not only aircraft, but containers and individual shipments on the status as well as the intended time of delivery. So to look at it, we need faster information and we don't have enough of it. Also in Hong Kong, we're embedded in terms of the space technology, which we rely on. Nextly, think of this, the satellite technology is not a sector, but it's an enabler. And if we look at data, data is today's gold in terms of the space economy. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our esteemed speakers, starting with first Professor Quentin Parker, who is with Hong Kong University, Physics and Laboratory of Space Science. Professor Quentin Parker. Uh, just uh, that person that asked you, Perry, about we don't have any satellites and blah, blah, blah. Actually, Chinese University of Hong Kong, and I'm sure you'll hear from Professor Lin later, have been involved in several satellite missions already, and they've got a long program of remote sensing. And indeed, Hong Kong University uh, launched uh, uh, with Nanjing University our first space research science satellite on July the 25th of this year. So that's actually not true any longer what your friend thinks. So that's part of the education process that we need to get through. Anyway, I'm actually not the head of physics. I was head of physics and then I became associate dean, but now I'm actually director of the laboratory for space research at the University of Hong Kong here in Cyberport, actually in Cyberport 4, just a neighbor to where we are here today. Okay, may I have the first slide, please? So this is the first slide. You can see Hong Kong Laboratory for Space Research, the burgeoning space economy. I think there's no getting away from the fact that the space economy is becoming an increasingly important part of the global general economy with billions and billions of dollars uh, going to be spent on it, you know, even a trillion dollars by about 2037 in a global space economy. But can we open the door to such a thing here in Hong Kong? So this is what this whole webinar is all about. So when you come up to a door, I mean, the thing about conservative societies, you wonder about what's behind the door. Do you open the door? Do you carefully put it in the jar and look in? Or do you try to burst through that door and try to get on there and get going uh, and be brave about it? I think that's one of the discussions here in Hong Kong is how the government gets engaged with the opportunities that are coming up through the burgeoning space economy. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the LSR first, very quickly. There's the web link there at the bottom. Uh, we have a mission at the LSR. Uh, we've only been going uh, since about 2016. I've been director only for a couple of years. Is to emerge as a leading interdisciplinary research center in space and planetary sciences across the Asian region with a strong identity. To maintain and grow the LSR to be an internationally recognized brand for research excellence principally in main space science and related programs, including planetary sciences. And finally, and here's the thing, to strengthen and develop our ties to the mainland space program and globally, and that includes with a commercial eye too. I think that's very, very important. So, I believe that the government will recognize and engage more with the space economy when the top universities in this country are also more strongly engaged and make their presence felt. Because I think you need both. You need an engaged tertiary education sector, not only to produce the educated students of high value in STEM that will go into these emerging um, economy, but also because of the reputation that these places have. So Hong Kong U has this reputation and power to gr and grasp to open such doors to the burgeoning space economy. We've already opened doors to the world's best place in planetary sciences groups around the world. We've opened doors to establishing joint labs with top mainland science and planetary science entities. We have a plethora 
of agreements and um, memorandums of understanding, some of the best and most important groups in the mainland and globally, including um, the Shanghai Academy of Space Flight Technology, Chechang University, Nanjing University, the Natural History Museum in London, Part of Assistance in Italy, uh, etc. And all these doors of opportunity are really there. We don't even have to knock on them now because these doors are open to us if we just need to walk through. We've recently signed an MOU with the Chinese Space Utilization Group in May, and we hope this will lead to a joint lab with the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Space and Planetary Sciences at Hong Kong U. So we can be inside of the education and the research and the science, but that is also gets the public eye and engages the whole community more in all ideas around space, including commercial exploitation. So this is just an indication of who we partnered with now. You see in the top left there, the OASA logo. We're very proud, DLSR, to be one of the first, and, uh, and I would say that's one of the strongest supporters and engages with this brilliant idea that OASA is, and, and we intend to continue to play our full role in the future. But these are some of the, uh, all of the partners, actually, that we currently have. Just a couple of slides about the size of the global space economy from last year. 277.4 billion dollars US of global revenues. Growth has been mod modest in certain areas and much more strong in others. Launch industry has been strong, ground equipment is 5% growth. Satellite manufacturing increased by 26%. A lot of this is not big satellites. A lot of this is a new CubeSat microsatellite nanosatellites where a lot of energy is being expended. In fact, Hong Kong U is uh, about to start a major 6U CubeSat program for a small gamma ray telescope. Okay, so a very busy slide, but what you can all see here is actually the top right is the amount of money that gets spent in different areas. And in Hong Kong, I think the things that will be relevant to us is going to be satellite services, downstream uses of data, smart information use, big data, AI, because we have the technology and expertise in this city uh, to engage strongly in those areas. So that's an image of our satellite as being assembled and finalized in Shanghai before it was shipped to um, uh, just uh, to the west of Beijing for the launch that you see there. It happened on July the 25th. This is a science research satellite. It's not a commercial satellite, but it shows the intent of our university and the laboratory of space research to engage in this area, to get students and postdocs and others interested in working in the space industry. And we've got internships set up with some of the best uh, mainland uh, space programs and entrepreneurship follows. So we have a footprint in the door of the GBA a space economy because we have a major proposal to set up um, in Dongguan. Uh, well, it's not going to be called the LSR now. I'm renaming it if we set up there to the International Space and Planetary Institute for Research Excellence. And I hope that this new place will inspire young minds in the GBA and in Hong Kong to get involved in the space economy. So the lobster eye X-ray satellite that you saw earlier was just the first of our major projects. We've got a UV telescope we hope to launch in a satellite next year, and we've got a CubeSat gamma ray telescope we hope, hope to launch after that. Now, OASA for us is an important part of everything we do, and we're very happy to be engaged and partnered with them in opening doors to collaborative projects. So this is just a picture of what we hope to do in Dongguan. There's a rather lot of information there. The CubeSat program is highlighted down there in yellow, and, uh, and this is kind of the things that we want to do, but and you can look at that on the webinar recording later if you want to look at the nitty gritty details. But here, you can see this Inspire Lab that we hope to set up in the, it'll be the new joint lab with the Chinese Academy of Sciences, both in Hong Kong, at Hong Kong U and in Dongguan, is this at the bottom commercial focus with Guangda, Oasa and others. There will be a significant part of our activities, we'll be looking at how we can exploit the space economy for our university with spin-off companies and, and ideas and, and everything else. Okay, interdisciplinarity is key. Space technology is a key focus. It opens doors with the electronics and right sensing, automation, computing science, big data, propulsion, metrology, material, everything you can think of a high tech, there's a footprint of it in space economy. And so that's where the STEM interest is. These are all STEM projects. We need to get our students in this city engaged in these areas and interested in opening up to the possibilities of engaging with the global space economy. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, and uh, I'll now uh, hand over to the next speaker. All oh, right. Back to Perry, actually. Yes. Thank you, Perry. Thank you very much, Quentin. Yes. Right. And thanks for that update on the great initiatives you're taking over to LSR. Uh, our next speaker now I'd like to invite to stage and actually have a conversation with uh, is uh, Mr. Tujan Chani. 
who's the partner at Fresco. So Thank you. welcome. Okay, welcome. <laughs> Please join me here. Here you are. Yep. Thank you for uh, thank you for having uh, me, and uh, really uh, a pleasure and an honor to be uh, on this distinguished panel. Um, I on purposely didn't uh, make uh, slides because mm. I do think that uh, space um, is a very fluid uh, topic, um, and there's a lot going on there. And so, uh, I, a professor before us did a marvelous job of summarizing on a very high level all the things that we can do. But I wanted to start with uh, a slightly personal story because I think one of the things we wanted to do today is inspire, uh, you know, um, uh, others to take a look at the space economy. Absolutely. Right. And um, so my personal story is like, how did I get interested in space? Uh, I was born in uh, a country that no longer exists, um, Soviet Union. Mm. Right? Yeah, right. And so. We remember, uh, you know, the, the moon landing, right. but uh, before the moon landing, uh, the Soviets were the first, uh, you know, country to send people up into space with Yuri Gagarin, 1961. Uh, a few years before uh, Armstrong uh, and his famous first steps on the moon. Mm. And so that, that became an inspiration uh, to a lot of people from that generation who were born in the Soviet Union. And as a child of that uh, time, uh, it's slightly after <laughs> I was born, uh, uh, slightly before I was born, but that really inspired me to look into space. And so what is Hong Kong's uh, Yuri Gagarin moment? What is Hong Kong's um, Armstrong moment? Absolutely. Um, and I think uh, we're still looking for that, but uh, just because it hasn't happened yet, uh, and maybe uh, on this panel, uh, we will find out that it has, but we should not stop trying and we should not stop looking, right? Uh, so uh, I encourage people to continue to look into space. Uh, and uh, if we fast forward from 1960 to today, uh, so much has changed, right? Um, and Professor Quentin mentioned the things that have changed. Yes. Um, but one very basic, uh, I think, change that has happened is uh, the private sector uh, has gotten significantly more involved in space. Tell us a little bit more about that in terms of the private sector. Yep. Uh, so uh, private sector uh, is essentially when contracts are going out of uh, the government from NASA, uh, European Space Agency, the Russian Space Agency, um, here closer to home, uh, the Chinese Space Agency, uh, the contracts are going away from them and more to the private sector. And we're seeing more and more of that. Uh, just in 2012, uh, 2020, um, the space sector attracted over $12 billion of investments. Mm. And that's private sector investment, not public sector investment. So that doesn't include NASA's budget. That doesn't include the uh, China Space Agency budget, right? So that's a, that's a pretty large number. And one extra thing that personally gets me excited, and we'll, go, we'll come back to it full circle, is the uh, 300, over $300 million deployed in early stage space tech companies, mm. right? Because historically, we have identified space and we've associated space with very expensive projects, right? Right. Uh, that you need deep, deep pockets. And uh, that was true. Because if you look at the, the, the type of, you know, people that were involved in the private sector space uh, industry, Elon Musk, billionaire, Jeff Bezos, yes. billionaire, <laughs> right? Uh, Richard Branson, billionaire, Paul Allen, Billionaire, right? So that, that list is, you know, mega wealthy people uh, kind of got uh, involved in it. But that was 20 years ago. And how about today then? Today, yeah. yeah. Th that's the 300 million uh, plus that was just deployed uh, in just last, uh, just this year. It's not, it's not even the end of the year. Mm. And so funds, so full circle, funds like us, Fresco Capital, uh, we're much, much smaller than any of these billionaires that I just mentioned, but can start to get involved in the private sector because of uh, you know, some of the developments that Professor Quentin mentioned, and we'll be discussing further at this panel, but application layer stuff, mm. right? And I just wanna give, do I have time for one uh, example for uh, the- You've got three yeah. minutes. <laughs> cool. So there's a company that uh, we were very fortunate to invest in. Yes. Uh, it's called Spire. Uh, so uh, Spire is uh, a, a new wave, new age space company. 
and we have uh, we have a music break. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, new new age space company. Yes, and they launch what Professor Quentin uh, coined CubeSats into mm. space. So these are ten by ten centimeter small satellites that are significantly cheaper than the previous uh, satellites that NASA and uh, others used to launch. That's right, because when most people think about satellites, they think about huge structures, multi-million dollar investments. Mm -hmm. But to what you're saying today is we've got the CubeSat, which it makes it much more manageable for individuals. Individuals, small organizations, uh, private companies. Even and in schools, institutions, right? For sure, for sure. Yeah. They, cost, uh, they cost less than half a million dollars to design and, and launch. And uh, with the likes of SpaceX, launch costs are going down. And so uh, Spire was able to kind of converge on these trends of uh, lower cost satellites, cheaper uh, launches, and now has the third largest fleet uh, of uh, satellites uh, in the world. Oh, amazing. A private sector company, right? Yes. So they, all, they have over 100 satellites up in space and they monitor critical data such as GPS, weather, um, which is very important to our day to day. We don't realize it, but I Ubered here and that's GPS data, mm. right? Um, and so uh, they monitor those type of uh, data infrastructures. But what is really cool is um, if you think about the type of entrepreneurs that were involved, you needed a lot of money, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, yes. right? 20 years ago, the internet economy was exactly the same. You needed to raise $20 million just to build your own server, i.e. you needed to build your own infrastructure. And only then could you set up a internet company, right. pets.com, right? But that's why we had the internet bubble. Today, uh, what happened was Amazon Web Services completely changed that, right? Now anybody can set up an internet company, mm. much cheaper. Spire and the likes of Spire have started to build this infrastructure up in space that they invested into and now are allowing anybody to set up a space company on top of their infrastructure, just like Amazon Web Services. So now it's drastically reduced the cost of uh, a space company to be set up, not billions of dollars, now in the early uh, or early millions. And so it's much cheaper to become a space entrepreneur. And uh, I think that opens a whole floodgate of opportunities for entrepreneurs to uh, take advantage of. Excellent. And so I look forward to welcoming you back at the end of the session webinar. And we'll talk a little bit more about the opportunities here in Hong Kong for individuals. Absolutely. Thank you very it's much. It's my pleasure. <laughs> and with that, I'd like to invite our next speaker today. With that as such, uh, Rosanna Wong, who is an executive director of Yao Li Holdings, as well as founder and president of Ophelia Ventures, and of course, board member here of Cyberport Omasa. So Rosanna, could you please share with the group? Great, thank you, Perry. Um, good morning once again, everyone. I'm so privileged to be here. and. This morning, I think I'm gonna share with you our perspective in terms of being an entrepreneur and also sitting on a few board as a director. Um, space, space is a new economy. Is that true? What are we talking about? We're still living on earth, working very hard every day to put food on our table. Why are we looking into space and, and create a new economy? Is that really feasible? Let's have a look. In Cyberpod here, we have over 1,200 uh, companies here every day looking to R&D. What's our positioning? Well, being a board of directors, I feel it's my responsibility to help our ecosystem grow, not only in Cyberpod, but in general in, in Hong Kong as a whole. If you look at our direction, we awfully emphasize we're very good at FinTech, digital tech, insurance tax, prop tech, Again, smart living, e-sport, edutainment, those are really our edge here in Cyberport. More importantly, we all need to cultivate big data. We have to use AI, deep learning, to really see what we can do to push into the deeper level, never mind cybersecurity and blockchain. So what is next for Cyberport? How do we take our people grow into a different level? Is space economy really the case? Well, let's explore. Well, personally, I'm an entrepreneur. My day job is actually help run a family business. 
a, fam, a, a public listed family business in Hong Kong. And our edge is actually built in environment and built industry. As you know, having a, a running, help run a 60 years old company, you will imagine I face a lot of challenges. And the challenges is not only supporting our people, but taking our people to the, another way forward in this 21st century context, it's all about innovation. So I see myself as innovating every day and see my businesses as creating new businesses as well, taking the business to a next level every day. So how do I do that? I think through transformation. In the built industry, we are awfully um, sort of traditional in a sense that we have a cultural and heritage, heritage here. As you can see the picture, Loban is the icon that we worship because he is the true carpenter with a, through our history. He actually built a house without any bows and nuts. But now, through our company, we need to survive in a sense to increase on the productivity and not only enhance the process that we do, we need IT, IoT, beam and simulations to build, never mind AI and robotic to help to increase on the precisions. That's what we're doing right now. But that's not good enough. So in about 2013, around that time, I flew to Singularity University. We're based in NASA. We experienced so many different things. At the end of that experience, I was asked to become the board of director, uh, the advisory board as well. But that was the time that I, I firstly experienced autonomous vehicle. I sat on the Google first self-driven car. I felt like, wow, that's fantastic. I really can host a meeting inside the car. I have to look into the car, the spatial, how we do that. And there was experience to invest into a very small, the sm one of the smallest satellite dish, just like a fist. But I felt it wasn't the right time then. But we also introduced like counter crafting. We look into the materials in planet Mars, transport it back to Hong Kong. And then we can actually making precast unit in a much better advanced level. We call the counter crafting in a sense very much like 3D printing with structural wall as well. Is that the way forward? I often think to myself. So after that, in two, about 2016, I felt like I ought to do something more. So I set up a venture fund based in Science Park. We want to look into four major areas like infrastructure, environment, care and transformation. But what is the vision? The vision is to take my people to build a sustainable smart city, not only just for us, but for the next generation and many generations more to come, based in Hong Kong, but spread around the other locations like the Belt and Road and other countries as well. So from then we have about like four startup companies. We grew to now, we have about 10. And then we was about to have forming another, the 11th one. So what we've been doing is taking like our electric vehicle to a tonnage level Lucky enough, we actually won the very first project in Science Park, providing autonomous uh, vehicle as a service. So soon you will see autonomous vehicle taking people within our park. We're looking to hydrogen fuel cell on demand to help clean energy in terms of our vehicle. Because of COVID-19, we sort of looking into whether we can use plasma electron to clean our PPE and our mask and so on and so forth. But is that good enough? Is that enough? Well, we've been thinking maybe we should look into the space. I had a hotel, which was actually built about eight years ago, based in Soho. We saved two million kilowatt of energy per year. That's kind of like equivalent to 3.3 million Hong Kong dollars. That's good. That's really helped save the environment. But due to COVID-19, actually our sales dropped tremendously. So how do we sustain ourselves? Perhaps space is another area that we should look into. So space hotel, and what about space, space living? And what about even building a space smart city? Is that feasible? I think so. Maybe it takes time, but together, I think we can tackle that. Space will be my next destination. Again, building a future, space is possible. But we need all of you to work together with us, try to create this ecosystem. We have to start somewhere. And my takeaway with you this morning is, we feel the field chase actually for the explorer. And this journey is not alone because right now we, we have here, you have us and we have OASA here in Hong Kong. Lastly, in closing, 
we really feel space economy is the future. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosanna. Thank you for sharing your personal insights in terms of the various businesses you're involved in and the impact it has in terms of the space economy that you're working with. So now, ladies and gentlemen, we have the pleasure from China, actually, Professor Lin, who's the chief scientist at the Hong Kong Aeronautics Technology Group. And he actually will be piped in via Zoom. Professor Lin, I see you on the screen. Yes? Can you hear? We can hear Professor Lin. So we will turn it over to you for the next- Can you hear? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, thanks, Harry. And uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Hui Lin, a chief scientist from Hong Kong Aerospace Technology Group, and also the emeritus professor from the Institute of Space and Earth Information Science at Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, we started about 20 years ago, and we're working on this uh, business road from uh, what we call this Earth observation, use space technology to monitoring the Earth environment, uh, Earth village. Uh, I support the proposal to the former Vice Chancellor, Ethel Lee, and received his strong support and also strong support from uh, Hong Kong government ITC. And also my proposal also fully supported uh, my central government. And uh, this is a letter from the Minister Yu Guanhua, and the Minister of Science and Technology of China, and all leading scientists and engineers from mainland. They come to Hong Kong to support our research. Since then, we received about 200 millions from central government, also from Hong Kong government, to start all this kind of related uh, development. Start from the infrastructure, like satellite station, then go to develop, we can downlink data from satellites, then we develop software platform to process those data, then use those uh, 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 data, we test different applications, start from the ocean study, from farming, from uh, urban smart city, uh, from a disaster, different type of uh, 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 prototype system developed. We also start to transfer and uh, work with the business uh, uh, circle to form the company. For example, we started the first uh, high resolution satellite receiving station in Hong Kong, actually for South China. And uh, the radius, the coverage of this satellite station is uh, 2,500 kilometers. That means the well, east part will reach Japan and the north go to Mongolia and China boundary, boundary. And the west part, we can go to Indian Ocean. For south, so we can, you can see that we cover whole Philippines, go to Indonesia. Uh, for the data processing part, you can see the, the middle blue part. We start fusion data from uh, different satellites, then link those data with ground-based uh, wireless sensor network. Then we have uh, software to extract data, information out from a satellite image. Then we have uh, geometric modeling and uh, to build up a virtual, like virtual Hong Kong, virtual camp and the virtual uh, globe to do this kind of monitoring and uh, assessment of the environmental disasters. So especially for the Great Bay areas, uh, we are monitoring the infrastructure, uh, include the bridge and the high-speed railway, subway, all this kind of infrastructure because uh, those infrastructure just like a lifeline of our uh, urban, urban metropolitan area. For example, we can use satellite mapping out the imperfect service and uh, it include those illegal land use transfer. Actually, we help the Hong Kong government to do this kind of business. We also monitoring those ocean pollution, oil spill, and ocean, uh, ocean wind field to help out monitoring the environment of the ocean. And also they help to design for the windmill you know, farm. Especially for those underground construction which affect the stability of uh, Earth's surface, uh, we monitor in the Great, uh, Great Bay Area. Uh, for example, in Guang Guangzhou, Zhuhai, Macau, and Hong Kong. So this picture shows that uh, the which part 
and the, the right one can see which part is uh, stable, which part is not stable, and uh, can help the uh, geolo geologic scientists and others designers to help out this. And uh, this technology actually is using satellite repeat observe, observe the Earth's surface. And uh, we call the like, urban CT, that's like a hospital. We can use a CT scanner to find our human bodies, a 3D model. For example, we monitoring the, the subway uh, uh, from Shaqian to Central. Uh, this cost, the building substancy, we, we can monitor in that to centimeter, even millimeter, this kind of change speed. And the, this picture is about the Hong Kong Air International Airport. You see that the, the color change, the runway color change from green to yellow to red means the substancy. This part is uh, reclaimed from uh, ocean water. We all know the Hong Kong International Airport is very busy. One minute, not now, before it's one minute, one will be one airplane, the landing and the departure. We it's, cannot send people to the field to measure this kind of uh, uh, substance. It costs a lot and it costs a lot of time too. But uh, using our, my students are uh, using uh, satellites. We can do that very quickly and uh, several hours to do once. And we have a very high density monitoring dots. For example, over uh, 100,000 dots for within one square kilometers range. So you can see very detailed and uh, this kind of uh, uh, change, earth surface change. This become a very standard one, it actually become a typical uh, business model now adopted and, uh, from Shenzhen Airport, the Xiamen Airport, come to learn this kind of technology. This kind of technology also can develop business for other monitoring. For example, we, this technology has been used for monitoring the Hong Kong, Macau, and Zhuhai Bridge. This uh, uh, business model can also be developed for those developing and underdeveloped country. So we send students, uh, Chinese students to the United Nations, we give them software and also training those officers in uh, countries, underdeveloping countries the, and the developing countries. So that let uh, the uh, international organization recognize Hong Kong's uh, uh, the, strong, uh, the business uh, uh, the capability. So CHK become the first university member for the University Space Research Association. And uh, we formed a company and uh, this company, Hong Kong Aerospace Technology Group become the first member of IAF in Hong Kong. So uh, our company now is to try to build up, develop, you know, high spatial and uh, high temporal density, uh, this kind of uh, uh, constellation. And uh, that is the satellite station built up in the top tier of our CUHK. Uh, that's my uh, help and as uh, clearly to tell you about uh, what we've done for the last 20 years. Thank you very much, Perry. Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Lin. And also thank you for taking your efforts all the way from Nanchang to beam your message over to us today. So with that, we've got further insights with now just finishing up with Professor Lin over from the HKDAG. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Greg Lee, who is our chairman of OASA, and also he's adjunct professor at Hong Kong U. So Greg, welcome to the stage. Thank you, Perry. So Sean, I got, so can you put it up? Thank you. Uh, I just want to thank Cyberport, especially Stella and Anthony, to mm. go through this ordeal with us. It wasn't easy. Um, yeah. We started almost back in September. And I also have to thank the speakers, Quinton, Rosanna, Bushan, uh, Professor Lin. He's actually popping in from Nan Nan Nanchang. Okay, so yeah. everybody's coming together for this. And it is fantastic. So anyway, my role, this is me. I can see my face up there. Okay, let me see if I can flip. The, it, it works, okay. So my discussion today is to talk about where and how. Where is the space economy? How has it arrived? And I'm actually doing this along with Professor Stephen Germ, okay, who's my partner. We're supposed to teach a course, Entrepreneurship in Space at Hong Kong U. So hopefully we'll get that happened. I'd like to begin with some context. Okay, where? 
What are we talking about? Where is space? Space is 100 kilometers above. That's called space. Okay? Now, space is hard. It is far. Far just like one belt, one row. So when we talk about one belt, one row, what are we talking about? Distance. How do you serve a customer from a distance? In space, things has to work. It cannot not work. Right? That's very, very important. You have to remember that. Things get to deliver in space, has to work in space. There's no return. Okay? And how do you pay for some goods in space? Question you ask every day. How can you leverage on Hong Kong? Now, so what's up there? There's a lot of things up there. Okay? And between the Earth and the Moon, it's called a place called Cislunar. There's something like 20,000 satellites, over a million pieces of little junk flying around, space debris. So what is the size of the market? So Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, they even estimated, we're looking at trillions of dollars by 2040. What can we do with it? What's, what's happening? Power, asteroid mining, microgravity, satellite servicing, space tourism, something that can happen in Hong Kong, by the way, science missions, new generation satellites. All these are happening right now in the back of us. So how do we know? Do we know? Now let's look at the space, okay? So airplane, you know, you see the airplanes there. <laughs> Anything above airplane level, incidentally, belongs to China. China has to say, Hong Kong, let's do this and we'll do it, okay? Now, you see the CubeSat and the International Space Station. China, 2025, will have, have their space stations and there'll be so tremendous, tremendous amount of development because of this space stations. By then, the ISS won't be around, 2025. So what is a LEO? LEO, we're coming down to a little lower, 200, 400 kilometers. We're looking at little satellites. So who's involved? SpaceX. And if you were listening to Professor Lin, Hong Kong ATG will be involved, okay? They'll be shooting up satellites up there and they'll be sending down data. Now, those of you who are looking at some of the um, uh, falling stars last week, and you see some streaming things across, that was actually SpaceX. Can you imagine someday, the whole Earth will be blanketed with wires across? <laughs> you can imagine how we'll look. You actually can see those satellites. Now, have a thought on that. Now, these are some of the individuals involved. OneWeb, uh, Blue Origin, Samsung. OneWeb, by the way, has declared bankruptcy in the UK, but they're coming back. <laughs> so why now? Next question. We talked about where, so I'm gonna focus on why now. Now, if you remember your history correctly, there's the man, 50 years ago. It's been 50 years, now we're back. So what are we doing? What's happening? What's happening in 50 years time? And you find that so much is happening. Now, if you're looking at this map, you can see there are certain, on the middle part, okay, the number of spacecraft launched, there's a huge shot up of, spacecraft going through the air. Majority, American and US and China, okay? Now the space economy, 366 billion. That's huge. How big is that? It's about the size of Hong Kong. Interesting. Now, the thing is, anybody can get involved in this particular space, any nation. Why Hong Kong? Well, look at it or not, space is the next frontier for us. Government has to get involved. But the government has to understand what is space. And that needs a lot of education from people like Quinton, people like uh, Fushan to see what's going on. There are two verticals that OASA is one you're interested in. One is commercial, the other is academic. Okay, we, don't, we don't want to go to military. <laughs> That's not where we want to go. Um, the new space industry has a direct link back to Earth. And we were saying a little bit earlier, if Shenzhen is a factory of the world, why can Shenzhen be producing things as needed by the space sector, okay? So what do they go through? Hong Kong. Hong Kong is all the right stuff. What we don't have are the entrepreneurs, the mindset, and the coordinated effort. Okay, this is a CubeSat, and this is all made in USA. And it, in our investigation, we found that several years ago, even Nepal, we're making CubeSats by high school students. Cambodia, Korea, India, Philippines. What happened to Hong Kong? We're not there. Now, if you can remember the ins inspiration of space, 
space inspires individuals, okay? Inspires them to, to do, to explore. And these are some of the quotes coming out because of the Apollo um, in, in 2009, a survey by Nature Magazine. Okay. How might we grow this in this greater Bay region? Can Hong Kong become a space hub in 10 years time? Why not? We have to start thinking about it. It doesn't, it's not gonna happen by itself, okay? So let me quickly talk about this page. For Hong Kong, it is not about shooting satellites up. It is about understanding the data coming down, okay? The satellite data, how do we monetize that? That is gonna be huge. These are all different industries. I'll leave the slides with you and you make sure that you get a copy so you can see actually the many industry. The key thing you have to remember is space is an enabler. It cuts across all industries. Interesting, huh? <laughs> now, our own Lee Ka-shing invested in space called Leo Lab. What, is it, what do they do? They remove space debris. There's so much junk up there now. Well, you probably didn't know, okay? It's actually going to be quite hazardous. Now, I just want to talk about some venture capitalists actually investing in space. And if you look on the right side, the bottom, number three, you see Fresco there. <laughs> okay, so Fushan is from Fresco, by the way. Okay, why now, why Hong Kong? Let me summarize. Space is an enabler. What we need in Hong Kong is more entrepreneurs, more innovators. And by having this space, we create an ecosystem that's broader, richer. We allow Hong Kong to contribute to China, being part of it, link it back to Greater Bay. The market is already here. And as you know, in business, everything's on timing. I'd like to conclude, okay, on some points. One, how might we set up a space accelerator at Cyberport? We'll combine and bring people together. Now, Beidou, as we know, is a much more powerful than GBS. It's two-way communication. It's already happening. 5G is already here. Okay, how do you connect this? Two, space law. We need to develop that. We stopped developing in 1997. There must be a huge amount of investigation. The telecommunication in Hong Kong is actually quite well developed, but the remote sensing legislation needs more understanding and more development. So space law <coughs> enriches our space and legal industry. How might we fast track space related companies to our Hong Kong exchange, right? Like we've done with biotech, why not? Last year, there was over 100 startup companies in China created in the space arena. Last week, there was a company called Charming that raised 350 million US dollars pre-IPO. When a reporter asked them, where are you going to list? They didn't say Hong Kong. Why? Because we need more education in Hong Kong. It's a huge industry. This is how it links to FinTech. How might we create a trainers program to train college students so they can train grade school students, okay? This definitely we can do, okay? And Professor Quinton's chicken is head, we can definitely do it with them to our mission number two at OASA. Lastly, for every astronaut in space, there are thousands of support crew, okay? Next place we're going is the moon and Mars, and they need tremendous amount of support on the ground level. So I just want to want to make sure that I thank Perry, <laughs> our vice chairman. Um, Perry is an excellent coach. Um, he coached me along with this, how to put it to you in, in a good way. <laughs> but I can't speak for the man because he's the one who trains TEDx speakers and I'm not, not a TEDx speakers. Okay, Perry, can I give it back to you? All right. There. All right. Thank, thank you. you very much, Greg. You don't need this? Yeah. Okay, good. I got that, yeah. Thank you for that very insightful sharing that you just gave everyone today in terms of the space technology and Hong Kong. Now, what I'd like to do to wrap up the session is invite all our speakers back on stage. And with that, let them share a little bit in terms of closing comments for everyone of what we have talked about today. And also perhaps what you can do in terms of Hong Kong to get involved, to move forward with this great initiative. So please join me up here on stage. Here we are. <laughs> All right. So with that, we've had some very enlightening sharing today in terms of these thought leaders here on stage. And with that as such, you're probably wondering, there's a lot of very good information here, but 
what can I do? How can I be involved? What could be perhaps some next steps that we can look at? So what I'd like to do is go around with each speaker and ask for maybe a one minute closing comment to kind of highlight what they have shared as well as perhaps what they've heard in terms of today's webinar. So with that, Susanna, can I start with you, please? Absolutely. Um, I learned a lot. I thought I knew a lot about the space economy, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, today was uh, an, another stark reminder that you can never, you know, the, the, the rabbit hole keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, was, this was enlightening. It was fascinating. And so uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, making this happen. Uh, and uh, I wanted to shout out to uh, the Academy o uh, OASA that uh, organized this. I think uh, if there's one takeaway that we can have, at least my personal takeaway, is that uh, regardless of what industry you're in, be it real estate, be it uh, finance, be it shipping, uh, human resources, uh, transportation, um, it really uh, doesn't matter. You can still be involved in the mm. space economy, right? So uh, my takeaway was you don't have to be uh, from the space industry to be in the space industry. Um, and I think that if, if anything, that should be, you know, uh, encouragement to, uh, you know, the seven plus million people in Hong Kong and the whole world to kind of start taking up more challenges uh, within the space economy. Right. So the message is that, you know, the opportunities for all of us to seize, especially since most of us don't have that expertise in space or space economy as such, but there's the opportunity for us to grasp. Great. Thank you, Suzanne. Now, can I pass it over to uh, Professor Parker and share a little bit of your insights and then we'll go to Professor Lin over in China. Professor Parker. Thanks very much, Perry. I'd just like to say actually that uh, I don't know if people are aware that the uh, Changi 5 mission uh, returned the samples of the moon back to Earth yesterday, several kilograms of moon rock. Oh, fantastic. Uh, fantastic result for the Chinese space program. And I think Polly Yu was actually involved in, in part of that mission in terms of the camera on the rover that were landed on the moon. So uh, a little bit of Hong Kong interest there. But for me, uh, uh, listening to everybody's uh, wonderful presentations, uh, and especially the one at the end from Greg too, is the importance of education mm. that underpins everything. You can have all the entrepreneurs in the world, but if people are not educated to understand what these opportunities mean and how to grasp them, I think then it's going to fail. So it's about STEM education. It's about an engaging our young people and our talents in the future of the space economy in this wonderful city. And I think, you know, Hong Kong U itself is, is launching a, a top postgraduate program, Masters in Space Science. And then Greg mentioned that he's going to be a teacher of the entrepreneurship component. And we're very lucky uh, to get Greg to do that for us. And it's a core component of our course uh, set up by the LSR last year, but because of COVID postponed until, until next year. But so I think for me to take our message is education, education, and then probably after that education. Okay. Excellent. And the opportunities for us to engage and maybe even the program that you just mentioned. Absolutely. And we've got great internships under that program ah. with uh, all over the world. There we are. So another opportunity, internships. Now, Professor Lin, can I reach out to you via our satellite technology and share with us one takeaway and insight that you'd like to provide to the audience today? Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Hong Kong is a quite very unique place. We can do a lot of things. Uh, for example, in the last 20 years, we've been working on using remote sensing for energy, uh, for precise farming, from like uh, environment monitoring for smart city, the different fields. I think it's a very uh, useful you know, platform now. And uh, Hong Kong is a very unique. United Nations would like to use Hong Kong as a training hub because we are in the middle of the Asia and the people can easily come to Hong Kong and we are international city and very good people like come to our university campus, beautiful campus for training. So there's a lot of business start from uh, helping, you know, industry, you know, promote the industry, the more, uh, the more advanced one to help the community. Now we call the uh, high quality development age. We need a precise measurement. So I think uh, remote sensing in Hong Kong is quite, you know, good opportunity for different type of business from industry to training. And we can help the in, uh, uh, international community to do this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Lin. And so we talked about earlier too, I mean, remote sensing 
autonomous driving, smart seat at the airport. It is around us. Great. Now I'd like to uh, pass it on to uh, Rosanna to share a little bit in terms of maybe just an insight today <laughs> and a takeaway for our sure. group here. Sure, thank you. It was just the most enjoyable morning. Actually, um, I think we all, all have to have a dream, but having a dream is not enough. I think we need to have vision, we need leadership, we need the togetherness and collaborate together in order to make that dream happen. We're very fortunate that we're here in Cyberport. In fact, we have a broad meeting tomorrow afternoon. I think I'm gonna to talk to my management team <laughs> as well as my, our chairman to explore with them that um, perhaps space economy is one of the key direction that we should have in Cyberport. And again, take on the advice and suggestion that Greg just mentioned just now, you know, um, maybe set up a space accelerator is not a bad idea. We should push that and see what we can help our ecosystem. And for my personal investment, I think um, the Astro platform that we've been talking about for a few years now, we really have to put that into action in order to speed up this um, space economy that we might have in, in Hong Kong. So that is my little sort of sharing this morning. Thank you, Harry. Oh, thank you very much, Rosanna. And we look forward to a very good meeting that you'll have and how we move forward in those particular directions as such. And so, Greg, anything else you'd like to add? I just want to say thank you first yeah. to Perry and to the panel, uh, Professor Hui, all the way there. Yeah. Um, your comment and Quinton's comment on education, yeah. that's going to be huge. I think the first thing we have to do in Hong Kong is space education. Um, I want to come back to what is the purpose of why we're doing this. Mm. Okay. We're here because of two very important things. One is innovation. Innovation requires a rich diversity of ideas. And that is perfect. Second is, is entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs create jobs. If there's no entrepreneurs, there's no jobs, right? It is very powerful. We need that. And the vision of OASA is 10 years from now, Hong Kong can be, should be a space hub. If we don't dream about it, it's not gonna happen. Now to get there, we have three simple missions. First mission is to coordinate and reach out to companies kids, young people, to create something that makes sense for Hong Kong. The second thing we want to do for mission number mm. two is to train college students so they can train grade school students on how to curate a CubeSat. Right? The third one is actually get Hong Kong citizens into the China space station. So in the next few years, we'll be very busy and I look forward to all your help in getting this off the ground. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Greg. So with that, we've received a lot of interest on the chat in terms of the materials that have been shared with, from each of the speakers as such. So just to let you know, we'll be posting them on our Facebook and LinkedIn sites. In fact, if you look now, you can access those particular sites with the slides that you're seeing. In closing, I'd like to again thank Cyberport for the opportunity of hosting us and the professional productions team that they have here who've made this a reality. Uh, I'd like to leave you one thought as such. Many people think about space as a particular sector, but here's the reality. It's not a sector, it's really an enabler. So the opportunity for all of us here in Hong Kong, as well as in China, is how do we seize this opportunity of space being an enabler and how we can move forward with that. So I would like to thank you again for joining us today for the webinar. As everyone shared, we have a lot more exciting webinars happening. Uh, starting in 2021. So stay tuned for our social media. And please, if you have an interest, contact us and join OASA Hong Kong. So with that, thank you for today. And we look forward to the next opportunity in which we can meet again in our future webinar. Have a good day.